لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبد الله ورسوله ارسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وان كل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد ان يقول اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم تبارك الذي جعل في السماء بروجا وجعل فيها سراجا وقمرا منيرا وهو الذي جعل الليل والنهار خلفا لمن اراد ان يذكر او اراد شكورا وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الارض هونا واذا خاطبهم الجاهلون قالوا سلاما والذين يبيتون لربهم سجدا وقياما رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي امين يا رب العالمين ان شاء الله ان تدريس بريف خطبة I'd like to share with you a few ayat that belong to a very powerful surah and a short surah relatively of the Quran Surah Al-Fuqan and there are many beautiful qualities of Surah Al-Fuqan and in particular of these ayat and I just want to highlight a couple of them one of them, of course, is that right before we get into these ayat, Allah Azza wa Jal revealed an ayah of a sajda. So the ayah right before this one, when the Muslim is to recite it, we're supposed to fall into sajda. And it's actually a conversation with people who commit shirk. Among the mushrikun of Mecca, there were people who recognized the word Allah because they were using it even before Islam. But when they heard the word Ar-Rahman, then this was a new name of Allah to them. And even though it's obvious that it's referring to Allah Azza wa Jal, when somebody wants to act ignorant, and they want to act like they don't know what you're talking about, then they pretend like they don't know. So they would say things like, who do you worship, God or Allah or Ar-Rahman? Who do you worship? Why do you keep talking about this Ar-Rahman? And Ar-Rahman is not something new to the Arabs also from the, from the Islam, Islamic point of view, because the ayat that refer to Ar-Rahman are the, some of the earliest revelations. For example, the Fatiha. Fatiha is the first complete surah to be revealed. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. How many times they must have heard Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim? They know enough Arabic to know that Ar-Rahman is a describer of the word Allah. But regardless, when you have to dismantle or undermine somebody's argument or somebody's invitation, then you can say anything obnoxious that comes in your head. And so they said, what Ar-Rahman? What are you talking about? And so in the ayah before, not only did Allah introduce us to Ar-Rahman, He introduced us in such a powerful way that the believers, when they hear that, they are compelled to fall into sajda. They can't even continue to go about their day and just listen on the side. This is an ayah of sajda. Now, when one falls into sajda, this is the most humble position that a slave of Allah can be in. Even from the point of view of a non-believer. When a non-believer sees us pray, they don't know what salat is, they might even come and start talking to you. Because they don't know that you're praying. They don't know what that means. But they will notice that your hands and your eyes and the, the look on your face, this guy is humble before someone. What's going on? Something's on his mind. You know? Then when, they, when we go into Rukur, it's like the expression of exhaustion. You know when sprinters and things like that, when they run a long time, what do they do? Literally, they just grab their knees like, I can't do anymore. You know? This is our expression that we are weak before Allah is always. And then sajda, there is no society in the world that doesn't understand that that is actually an expression of the ultimate humility. You came in before somebody. As a matter of fact, in the most ignorant talk shows and you know sports shows, they'll have famous athletes come and like just as a joke, the fans are going to be like doing expressions of sajda. Even today, even today in stadiums and things like that, it's incredible. But I, the point I'm trying to make is sajda is the most humble position you can possibly be in physically. And actually, that's supposed to be psychologically also. Psychologically, we should be completely humbled before Allah. And when you're completely humbled before Allah, is the best time to declare two things. Not only how low you and I are, but how high Allah is. 
So we're supposed to go into these ayat that I'm trying to share with you. The intent of the surah is to, to venture into these ayat with an unusual state of humility. How full of barakah. How full of barakah. That's not make, trying to make the translation easy to understand. You know, in English translations, they say, How blessed is the one that placed a brilliant source of light, a brilliant <coughs> thing in the sky. Burj is actually a brilliant tower that you can see from far away. You can't see anything in the city, there are no lights, but there's a tower and there's a light on top. That's a burj. You can see it from a distance. Allah says, Burujan. He put multiple brilliant towers up in the sky referring to what the stars look like. Stars look like their own civilization. Burujan. Waja'ala fiha sirajan. And he put in it a massive lamp. Siraj is an unusually brilliant lamp. Waqamara munira. And he placed inside it a moon that gives off light or deflects light. So Allah refers to the stars, the sun, and the moon. He refers to these things. And in each of them, he referred to their quality of giving light. You should appreciate that. That in each of them, Allah could have called it the sun, the star, the stars, the sun, and the moon. But instead of using nujum, he used buruj. Instead of using the sun, as shams, he called it siraj. And instead of just calling it qamar, he said qamar al munira. And all, of, all three of them, there's the matter of light. There's the matter of brilliance. And this is important because Surah Al-Furqan is the surah that the right before it is Surah Al-Nur. So that the, the effects of nur are still on the reader. The, the, the effects of light that lives inside the chest of a believer are still fresh. Anyhow, I was going to talk to you about barakah for a little bit. Barakah means a ziyada to fil khayr in Arabic. They say a ziyada to fil khayr. Increase in goodness. In other words, I was going to do something, but if what I was going to do has barakah, then the outcome of it will be better than I even hoped for. It will produce more good than it's expected to produce. That kind of an action is barakah. If my word has barakah in it, it will produce more good than it can logically be assumed to produce. An action of barakah, and we don't have the power of barakah. We have, you know, in science they say action and reaction. They're, they're equals, right? There's an act, for every action, there's an equal but opposite reaction, or consequences even. They're expected consequences. But in the concept of barakah, it says, though Allah Azza wa Jal comes along, puts his barakah in something, and when he does, when he does put his barakah in something, then it, the goodness of it comes way more than any science can explain, any logic can explain. More goodness comes out of it into your life, into the lives of others. And Allah specifically mentions his barakah in this surah, in this surah, right after he mentioned his name, Ar-Rahman. In Surah Al-Rahman, you'll notice Ar-Rahman al Qur'an and at the end of the Surah, he'll say Tabaraka Asmu Rabbik He began with Ar-Rahman, he ended the Surah mentioning the Barakah of that name Meaning the word Ar-Rahman itself has certain special powers When we call on Allah with that name, the things that we do have extra Barakah in them Have extra power of goodness in them And that is why it's so understandable that in our deen, Allah Azza wa Jalla and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have instructed us, whatever good thing you start doing, you should start with Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. When we just say Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, now the things we're going to do, we are expecting from Allah to put more good out of them, bring more good out of them, than we could have expected ourselves, that no other human being could have done, you know. This is Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and on a side note, even though that's not my khutbah, just using Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is enough for a Muslim to always be optimistic. To always be optimistic. Because we call on the name of Allah that's full of barakah. So whatever I'm going to do, Allah is going to increase it. Allah is going to put good in it. The results of this are going to be good. And that's not up to me or my effort or my qualifications. Even though I should try and do my best, that's because of the barakah of Allah in the end. Now, Allah referred to the sun. Or rather the stars. Then he talked about the sun and the moon. Then he says, And he made the night and the day conflict with one another. But then he, in this particular ayah, describes why. That the, the haf lam in the Arabic language that's coming, liman arada an yadakka wa arada shukura. Li can be the word, you can translate it easily as four. He made the night and the day go against one another, meaning they're always battling. The sun has positioned itself, and it's heading down, and the, the night is starting to win. And as Asr and Maghrib appear, you can see the battle being won by the night. And then this battle will start again next morning. You know, this khilfa, this succession constant going back and forth, one behind the other, is going to keep happening. 
Allah said, why is it made and for who is this sun and night and day produced? لِمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَذَّكَّرَ For the person who wants to make an effort to remember. When you say تَذَكَّرَ in Arabic language, then what you're saying is not only do you make an effort to remember, you are ready to take advice. You know, وَمَا يَتَذَكَّرُ إِلَّا أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ The people of the sharpest intellect, they're the only ones that will take the advice. When somebody says something, they say, yeah, this is the time that, that this advice applies. And this is a very important concept. A lot of times when you are doing something wrong and somebody tries to give you and me advice, we say, not right now. Not right now. There's time for that later. I don't need a lecture right now. You know? Give me, a, give me that reminder later. In Jummah, I can take a reminder. But not at home. Not when I'm angry at my employee. Not when I'm on an angry phone call. If somebody gives you advice at that time, be a little patient. Calm down. But you say, no. You know what? Mind your own business. Right now, I don't need the reminder. Allah says He made the night and the day. He kept, kept on going this, in this way so that whoever truly has the intention wants to benefit from the reminder, wants to take the reminder seriously, wants to make an effort to remember at the right time can benefit. What's the connection between night and day in this? Every single believer that wakes up in the morning, especially in the month of Ramadan, should turn to Allah and Allah says in the Quran, يُمْسِكُ sama. He's holding the sky back from destroying you. From destroying you. Literally you can imagine like an earthquake and a building's about to fall, or something's about to fall on you, and there's only one beam. Well, there's one person that's holding a door for collapse, collapsing on the children. You know? And he's saying, come on, come on. When that image is produced, then means you have no time. You have no time. In, uh, in the study of the universe, you know, in astronomy, they talk about how there are an uncountable number of flying objects in the universe that are hurling at massive speeds. And any one of them can hit the planet Earth at any time. So we're just kind of lucking out so far. So if it just comes and hits, we can't do anything about it. It will just be gone. I mean, there are black holes in the universe, they see stars imploding, they see all this stuff, and they say there's no scientific way to save the, the Earth from other destruction. So Allah, you know, He doesn't just say He's holding the sky up. Samat means whatever's above. Whatever dangers lie above you out there, Allah is holding them back from you. And so when you and I see another day come out, another morning wind, and another night wind that evening, then we say, Ya Allah, you held it back again, you gave me another chance to take advantage of your reminder. Because when Allah stops holding it, and the Earth's time runs out, that means my time ran out. So every single day a believer is supposed to have a sense of urgency that Allah out of His unimaginable mercy, Yannahu wa Rahman, because of that, He's giving you and me another day to live, another day to get our act together. Aw arada shukura, or also this, this sky is being held up, and this day and night conflict with each other continually. You get another day and another night, and another day and another night. Why? So that you can be grateful. For, for the one who intends to be grateful. For the one who wants to appreciate. Now there are two things, benefiting from the reminder and being grateful. Those are the two things Allah has talked about in this order. I'll say them again because this is what really the point of my khutbah is. Benefiting from the reminder and being grateful. Those are the two things that Allah highlights in this passage. Now, the very next ayah talks about one of the most important aspects of benefiting from the reminder. And it's very beautiful how it correlates with the sun and then the, the moon. The sun obviously daytime. So the behavior of the daytime is highlighted first. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, in this beautiful ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا The slaves of the Ar-Rahman, those who really enslave themselves to Ar-Rahman. Now I told you, who just made sajda? The believer. Right before we got into these ayat, we had fallen into sajda. And falling into sajda means we have declared ourselves slaves. And now Allah addresses those slaves. And He says, the slaves of Ar-Rahman, the slaves of the unimaginably merciful. The first thing Allah puts here that, that's unique, you know, وَلَمَّا قَامَ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ يَدْعُوهُ فِي الْجِنِ When the slave of Allah comes, stands up and calls on him, calls him Abdullah, here He calls them Ibad rahman the slaves of the unimaginably merciful. Meaning these are the people who are qualified for Allah's mercy. The people Allah is about to talk about, every one of us is Allah's slave. You know, Allah is not a wrongdoer. He doesn't do wrong to any of his slaves. But we are Ibad al-Rahman. 
These are the special slaves of Allah that deserve His special mercy. What, what's the first quality He's going to describe of them? I would think Allah might describe they do a lot of ibadah. They do a lot of dhikr. They, they do qiyamul layl. They stand in the middle of the night. They never forget Allah Azza wa Jalla in anything that they do. They're constantly thanking Him. Look at the first thing Allah is going to describe for these special people. These special people. Allah says, الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا They walk on the earth easily. هَانَ بِالْعَرَبِيَ حَفَّةَ هَانَ شَيْءٍ حَفَّةَ شَيْءٍ Lightly. Lightly. They don't want to make sure that when they walk somewhere their presence is known. Did you realize I'm here? You know? They don't stop on the earth when they walk. They don't go into the office or go into the school or go into anywhere as they walk in to make sure everybody realizes I'm here. They take it easy. They're not full of themselves. They're really not full of themselves. It reminds me of a funny story. We were at an Islamic program, somewhere I won't mention where, and this young man really wanted to be noticed as he walked in. So he had shades on, a couple of buttons off from his shirt, and he kind of like poses and walks in. And he's expecting people to look at him. Nobody looked at him. So he walked out again. And walked in again. I walked out again. I walked in again like three times. It was the most hilarious thing. <laughs> But he did all that. Why? Because you want attention. The first benefit of the word hawn is you don't want attention. You're just, you're, you're just yourself. You're not too concerned about other people's opinion about you when you're just going about your day. Hawn for younger guys here is that you're not, when you're walking into the masjid, you're checking yourself out in every mirror. You know? This, this self, completely self-absorbed type of walk. Hawn also means with sakina wal waqar. At the same time, this person is at peace. You know how some people, they're walking, they have a look on their face, an aggressive look, an intimidating look on their face, and you want like, I want to stay away from that guy. Or they're waiting for you to make eye contact, and as soon as you make eye contact, they give you a stare, and you're supposed to like turn the other way. Like you only look at them when they're not looking at you. That's the opposite of home. They are at peace, and if others look at them, they become at peace too. People calm down just by looking at them, you know. And understand, these ayat are not just about you and me walking on the street. You walk into home. You walk into home, do kids run or kids run to you? Or they run away from you? You walk into the office, you're the boss. People are afraid of you and you enjoy that. You're like, yeah, you know, better be scared. People avoid eye contact with you. That's not supposed to be the case. You're supposed to be humble when you walk. You're supposed to have a, a light character. Who do you think you are? Allah says, Wala tamshi fi al maraha, Surah al Isra. Don't walk around on the earth with full of pride, full of yourself. You're not going to talk facts on the earth. Who do you think you are? You're not going to reach the heights of the mountains with your stomping steps. You know, know yourself. Know your role. You know. So this is This is their own demeanor. Whether anybody they're talking to or not, on their own, they have a, a decent, self-respecting, but not full of themselves kind of attitude. And this is even body language. Quran even tells us humility is not just in speech, it's even in body language. How we carry ourselves. You know, how we go about ourselves. But then he says, وَإِذَا خَافَ بَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا If I don't even get to talk to you about anything else, I'd just like to finish this by talking about this. The literal translation of the ayah that many translations suggest is when the ignorant address them, they say peace. Whenever the ignorant address these people, they say peace. But let's dig a little further. This surah is Surah Al-Furqan. In the beginning of this surah, Allah Azza wa talks about all kinds of ridiculous things that the disbelievers claimed against the Prophet <coughs> They made all kinds of theories. He's insane, he's a magician, no, he's a victim of magic, no, on top of that, they dictate, iktatabaha. He has it written down by somebody, he's hired somebody to transcribe these stories that he's making up, as awaleen. All kinds of ignorant things are being said against the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the response that is the official policy given by Allah to His Messenger in, re in response to these kinds of ignorant attacks is وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا يَقْضُونَ وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى Just be patient over what they're saying. وَاجُرْهُمْ Abandon them, leave them. When they talk like that, leave them. What we are learning is, sometimes you're talking to somebody, and let's explore the word jahan for a moment, because it says وَإِذَا خَاطَ بَهُمْ الْجَاهِلُونَ Jahan in Arabic means someone who doesn't have control over their emotions. Aqal in Arabic literally means restraint. You know, there's a poet in Arabic who says, I wish my, my neck was one mile long. 
Why? Because by the time the words come out of my, my heart, and they're traveling in my neck, I get time to think, should this actually reach my tongue or not? Because <laughs> by the time the word comes out, oh man, I shouldn't have said that. That's Jahid. Jahid is someone who has no restraints over what comes out of his mouth. No restraints. Whatever comes in his mouth, he says. Some of you younger guys know, there are kids that are hanging out together. When kids are hanging out together, one of them wants to show off to his friends. So he'll be loud and obnoxious and say obscene things. And his friends are going to say, you're crazy, bro. You're so crazy. And he goes, that's right. And then he's going to say even more obnoxious things. This is Jahil. Let me show you how Jahil I am. Let me prove to you how Jahil I am. And we'll all be proud of it together. Now, that guy is crazy, man. You know? People insulting people in public, and that's what the way Khataba is used. Khataba isn't just used in any context. Khataba is used when you address somebody out loud and in public. You're trying to embarrass somebody publicly. Somebody comes to these people, and they're obnoxious. They don't have any control over their tongue. And it's public. They're humiliating you. They're doing all of that. How are you supposed to respond? You see, when somebody insults you, the first reaction is, Oh yeah? Oh, you think you know how to insult? I got a PhD. Let me teach you something. And you can, you, know, you can cuss like a sailor way better than he can. So you can respond. But Allah says, you know what they say? They say, Salaman. They say, peace. And Salaman actually implies, Usallimuka Salaman. Ah, from my side, you're not going to get anything but peace. If it was Salamun, I would be happy translating peace. Because it's Mansub Salaman, it implies, look, I'm at peace with you. I don't want anything to do with you. It also implies sometimes when people are talking to you in an angry fashion. Maybe like a good friend of mine, we were at this program and this Christian friend, an older gentleman, he figured out that we're Muslims. And when he figured out we're Muslims, he started cursing the Prophet and yelling and screaming, old man! And he's like, old, old man. He's on a cane and he can barely open his eyes, you know. And he's going at it. I mean, he won't stop. And the stuff he says should make you really angry. But you know what? This is not new. We are hearing these things about the Prophet now. <coughs> The people, the Sahaba, were listening to it with the Prophet standing right there. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of the famous stories that really moves me is that people came and they started, the Prophet was sitting with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa Allah wa They were sitting together. And these people came and they started cursing out the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Or actually cursing out Abu Bakr as-Siddiq first. They were yelling at him, screaming. They're, they're talking about his family. You know, the worst thing you can do, talk about your family. Cursing them out. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was patient. Doesn't even get up. Then they start talking against the messenger. They see that we couldn't get under his skin. We should try to insult the messenger. So they start insulting the messenger. So Allah is from. And Abu Bakr Siddiq can't take it. Got up. As soon as he got up, the Prophet left. So Allah is Now Abu Bakr Siddiq has a choice. Should I go after these guys? Or should I go after my messenger? So, so he picks the messenger. So Allah is from. And he went to him and he caught up with him. And he said, why did you leave? And he said, so long as you were sitting there patiently, the angels were surrounding us. And all of them were saying that Abu Bakr is committed to the truth. Abu Bakr al haq The moment you got up, they flew away. And I don't sit where angels don't sit. So he left. SubhanAllah. He's teaching even the most beloved, you have to. You have to learn to be quiet sometimes. The last thing I want to share with you about Khatabahu Jahilun, Qalu Salam. Even if I could do that much, hopefully some, some good lesson has been taught for myself and all of you. That is that jahad actually means not being overwhelmed by emotion. Being overwhelmed by emotion. That is why even Musa says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ أَنْ أَكُونَ مِنَ الْجَاهِلِينَ It doesn't mean that I seek refuge of Allah to become from the ignorant, those who don't know. He also is asking refuge from Allah. Ya Allah, don't let my anger, my emotions get so strong that I do something I regret later. Now at home, at work, among friends, sometimes somebody is emotional, somebody is really depressed, somebody is really angry, or you know that somebody has a, a little bit of a minefield, emotional minefield, you touch them a little bit and they explode emotionally. You know there are people like that around you. You should have the common sense as a slave of Al-Rahman not to poke and prod with those kinds of people. And if you talk to somebody in your family, you walk into home, a husband and wife, you walk into home, you look at your wife's face. And if you know your wife, your wife's face will tell you everything that happened that day. And you, your wife's face will tell you, it's a bad idea to talk to her right now. <laughs> it is a bad idea. 
and the wives know about their husbands. They walk in home, and he walks into home, she looks, she asks, how was your day? <laughs> she knows. This, today is a bad idea to ask him for the groceries or talk to him about what we're going to do on the weekend or let me just let him calm down, let him eat a little bit, let him just get it out of his system and then I'll talk to him. But if you start from the very beginning, what's going to happen? What you should know is going to happen. At that time, they're overwhelmed by emotion, they're stressed out, they're depressed, whatever it is, and then they're going to talk back very angrily. And then you're going to say, oh yeah, you had a long day, what about me? And it's going to start. It's emotional, psychological intelligence also. You don't just talk about what you want to talk about. You have to think about what is the emotional state of the person you're addressing. You have to be sensitive to them. These ayat are about courtesy. Not only are you humble in and of yourself, on the way you carry yourself, you consider what other people are going through before you say something to them. Maybe this is not the best time to give your son a lecture. Maybe he's a little stressed out right now. Maybe he's a little, you know, overwhelmed. Maybe find a better time. Maybe it's not the best time to tell your wife that she did something wrong. Maybe you could find a better time to do that. Maybe right now she's under a lot of pressure. You know? So you... And, and especially as they see, right? The wife is cooking, two kids are hanging off of her and all this stuff, and you're like, hey, you forgot to put salt in here? <laughs> Come on. Find a better time. Hey, you know, this was amazing. A little more salt next time, it'll be like from Jannah. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that, you know? You can do that. But just take it easy, in the, you know, don't say things. Don't say things at the wrong time. This is what he thought about the Jahiluna. May Allah Azza wa make us, make us of those that are sensitive when they open their mouth as a result of wanting Allah's mercy and this is my final, final reminder to you. And that is that this entire passage was about people, the special people that get the mercy of Allah. So to get the special mercy of Allah, we have to watch what we say. That's the first thing Allah described. They spend the entire night making sajda and making qiyam is mentioned second. This is mentioned first. Can you imagine? That is when we talk to Allah. When we make sajda and we make qiyam, we stand in front of Allah in the middle of the night, that's when we're talking to Allah. Allah said, before I teach you about talking to me, I'm going to teach you about talking to others. You have to learn to talk to others too. That's a matter of your heart too, because when you talk to others in a mean way, your heart becomes hard, and then you can't bring me a good heart when you're ready to talk to me. SubhanAllah. That's an incredible thing. So we, we have to become people of, 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 of conscience, of sensitivity, and may Allah Azza wa Jal make us a people of qiyam and sujood in the middle of the night. Barakallahu li wa lakum fi al-Qur'an al-Hakim, wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayati wa al-Nikdus Hakim. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتاب الله